Welcome to Seattle University School of Law, a webinar series. Today, we'll be discussing human-centric technology and criteria for ethical review. I am your host, Linda Hemer. I am also Senior Director of Graduate Law Programs for Seattle University School of Law. Really exciting. This is our a discussion about human-centric technology. And today we have some exciting things to talk about, plucked directly from the headlines. We hope uh, you walk away with some exciting takeaways uh, and that you know a little bit more about our program, about our uh, motto, and about uh, our professors. So, hot topic today. Our guest panelist is Dr. Tracy Kosa. Uh, again, our main focus will be on human-centric technology, a uh, high-level discussion of the criteria for consideration of ethical review uh, with a case study in facial recognition. We will have some concluding thoughts, then we'll discuss some next steps and have a short Q&A. I'd like to introduce a colleague, friend, uh, and thought leader and inspiration to us all, Dr. Tracy Kosa. Uh, Tracy, would you like to share a little bit about yourself after unmuting? Thanks, Linda. I appreciate the reminder. Um, <laughs> well, I mostly just wanted to say thanks so much for having me um, come and speak with you all today. I'm very passionate about SU and the amazing interdisciplinary opportunities that are at this university that are really nowhere else. So this is exciting. And how about a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I was born on a dark and stormy night, and it all went downhill from there. <laughs> no, I, in all seriousness, I got interested in privacy um, after I had a personal privacy breach, and that was about 20 years ago, and have been playing around in the space ever since. I think what's happening now is we're seeing this blend of privacy with ethics, with compliance, with legal, with tech, and it's just this fascinating place to be. My day job is uh, engineering, privacy engineering, at Google. Um, of course, I need to, for uh, their purposes, state that I'm not speaking on behalf of Google today. This is my free time, my lunch hour, in fact, that I'm delighted to spend with all of you. So we'll um, talk a little bit more from the perspective of being a prof at SU, working in the School of Law, working a bit in the Albert School of Business as well, and what my experiences and thoughts and research have been on this topic. Wonderful. You're ready to get started and dig right in, Tracy? Absolutely. Thanks, Linda. So we're going to be talking ethics, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. And I wanted to start off with just a little bit of, um, oh, it's a, it's a tech phrase they like to use called level setting, which used to mean, let's make sure we're all on the same page. So I do have a fairly strong tech background, especially recently, but I did spend 15 years as a bureaucrat, now recovering, uh, working in the Canadian government. And so I'm going to try and blend both the tech experience and language with the bureaucratic language and experience and hopefully throw some other industries in there as well. So this will not just be a tech talk from that perspective. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the process. What is an ethical review? what scenarios does this come up in and what's the ultimate outcome um, and then basically the goal for all of us today is to think about how we can use some of the questions I'm going to propose today to help bridge the gap between IT and legal uh, between engineering and product sort of help us get over the hump of having different experiences different education different nomenclature and how and what and who needs to be in a room to have a really important and impactful conversation about some of the design choices we're making in products and services these days. So I think with that, we could just jump to the next slide. Wonderful. Thank you. So we've identified a couple of different criteria. And when I say we, I wanna give you a little context before we jump right into it. One of the problems that I've had throughout my career and certainly have seen others get impacted by is that a lot of the really substantive privacy, security, ethical questions, they don't come up until you have a really good idea of what it is you want to do or how it is you want to build or create or develop something. And so thinking about what those requirements are 
often needs to be done early in the process, which is a difficult thing to reconcile just from a time perspective. I'm not talking about malicious, I'm just talking about the way design works. Someone comes up with an idea to build something, creates a prototype of it or starts it, and then gets to a point where they wanna share it or sell it or release it. And that's usually the point at which everybody starts talking about this thing called ethics. And it's usually a little too late by then. You wanna think about these questions as early in the process as you can. I, I used to say when I was doing privacy reviews regularly, that as soon as you have an idea, you should start thinking about ethics, start thinking about privacy, start thinking about who you need to talk to about this. But that's really an oversimplification. And I think the biggest thing I've learned in the past 20 years and working in this space is that it's actually a little bit more nuanced. And so what you're about to see today is the five-ish categories um, that I've developed over the years that are really good indicators that it's time that more substantive work is needed. So I'm going to jump through these one at a time. Um, and we're going to start with new or existing technology. And again, please use the language as broadly as you need to, to fit your career, your experience, and what you want to get out of today. But it's excuse yeah. me, Tracy. So really you could say a new or existing tool also. Even better. Thank you, Linda. I should have had you edit these slides first. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in that case, yes, we could think of this as a newer existing tool, a newer existing product, an idea, a service, anything like that. And the reason you want to break it up um, is because, as these wonderful graphic arrows I've designed indicate, if you have a modification to something that's already out there that's being used by people, you have slightly less risk from an ethical perspective that something new is going to pop up and bite you and potentially become an issue or have some unintended consequences for the people using your tool. Um, largely, that's because once things are deployed in any way, shape, or form, you begin to see how users use them and how people interact with them. And so ideas and problems will start to flesh out just with the use of the service. Now, what you're hoping is that it's not something that um, becomes a front page news story. And what I'm thinking of here was Microsoft a few years ago releasing a very cool artificial intelligence bot named Tay. And in my class, we use Tay as an example of unintended consequences. And for those of you who might not have heard about this, um, it was a very early middle of the week kind of morning in March when Microsoft Research very quietly announced that they had this cool new bot that was on Twitter and you could interact with it. And they were super excited about this piece of technology and code that was relatively new at the time that had been released to the public. Less than, I believe, 10 hours later, they had to take Tay offline because what was learned was that Tay learned very quickly from interactions with anybody, anywhere, unfettered and unedited. And so it took about four hours before Tay started spewing hate speech and doing so because the people interacting with Tay were having a little fun with it. Now, I think this is a really good example of why something new can represent a greater concern from an ethical perspective. In this case, we're lucky. Tay was monitored fairly carefully and um, was able to be pulled offline, wasn't in a position of making decisions for people or any kind of really substantive authority, but we did see a lot of unintended consequences there. And I think for the most part, if researchers playing in the space had sat down and spoken with someone who works in the space, someone in privacy, someone in ethics, a lawyer, um, maybe even just a run-of-the-mill philosopher at the pub, they might have had a better inkling of what the potential consequences are of releasing something that changes its behavior dependent on who it interacts with. So it's a pretty good criteria to think about whether it's more or less risk for you in this space. Next slide. The next criteria that has become a real consistent theme over my career is this notion of purpose and use. Um, and this is a slightly tougher one to articulate, but essentially when a product or a tool or a service is built, usually it's to solve a certain problem. 
And I think it may also be fair to say it's to address a specific need that someone might have, that notion that um, necessity is the mother of invention. Think of it that way. So when you think about text messages, good old ordinary plain text messages, um, a 240 character limit originally, for those of you who are old enough to remember back in the day, was necessitated because that was literally the technical limit of the technology. That was as much information as could be transmitted at any given time. Now, as a person with an iPhone, I'm very well aware that you can write very, very, very long text messages now. But there were technical limitations to what could actually be done with that technology when it was first invented, when it was first widely made available. But there are other things that don't really have technical limitations to them. Um, you may, in fact, not actually even be able to control what happens to a specific tool once you release it. And I'm thinking here of cars, cars, especially back in the day before they had a lot of electronics in them. We design them and a lot of cars go up to 240, 220 miles per hour. Um, we don't want you driving that fast though. So it's technically feasible, but we really don't want that to happen. And yet at the same time, there's lots of car accidents where people are driving really, really fast and recklessly. So this criteria gets at the notion of, are there actually by design certain limitations on what can be done with the thing, we're just gonna call it the thing that you're building or thinking about or developing, or is it really true that once it's out there, anybody can do anything with it? And that's where you get into that um, increased risk of unintended consequences. And that's really the crux of a lot of these ethical questions. Next slide. Reasonable person. Okay, this one is my favorite. I was so excited when I came across this term. Um, it, 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 I'm not sure where it originates, but I have seen it in law all over the place. And the first time I learned of it was when there was a Supreme Court case in Canada that was centered on the notion of who owns your information. And this is way back when, when records were on paper. And so you would come and see me in my office as a healthcare professional, let's say, and I would write notes in a file folder with post-its and a pen and keep those on you uh, for the purposes of providing you services. But also included in those notes might be comments that I'm making to myself about you, things you might need, recommendations I might have, observations I'm making. And so who owns that? It's my opinion of you, including observations I've made about you clinically, but it's sitting in a record that's in my office and you don't easily have access to it. So this was a really interesting court case. It made its way all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided that there was a really interesting concept at play here. As the clinician, you would have physical possession of the record and so the physicality of that record was in fact yours, but the contents of it were the patient's. And this decision was framed in the context of what was called a reasonable person test. What would a reasonable person's expectations be about information and data handling? And this is tricky, especially if you're not a lawyer, as I am not, to both wrap your head around the concept and use it in a meaningful way that doesn't tread on what some of the legal interpretations are of this notion in various contexts. So it's a little, it's a little harder to play with. Um, I also call it the, what would your grandmother expect kind of clause. So think about just a person you know, who isn't an expert in your field, in your industry, in your topic, or in the language of a lot of these ethical issues. What would their expectations be in a given situation? And Linda, in fact, gave me a great example of this the other day when we were chatting. If I told my grandmother, in 1960 when she was going to the airport that she could fully expect to have a physical pat down by a stranger for no reason because she wanted to get on a plane she would have been horrified absolutely without a doubt horrified like to the point where she probably wouldn't have flown 
But I go to the airport, used to, regularly, and have the expectation of that every single time I go. It is perfectly normal now to not only walk through a body scanner, but potentially be selected randomly for a pat down in front of everyone in the airport and 76 different cameras and all of that information to be recorded and visible for everyone in perpetuity. So this is where we get to this tricky part about reasonableness. What's reasonable really depends on context and outcome. So things have changed dramatically in air travel and the context of air travel has changed. So the outcome of that is that the reasonable person's expectations have now changed of what that experience should be. Next slide. All right, let's talk about scale. Scale is tricky. Um, originally, if you think about this just in a technology context, Anything that you release to a small select group of people for a small select purpose, say uh, um, a team or a group that has been identified for a specific test of a product or a feature that they need specifically for them for work. Generally speaking, you would think of that as being lower risk for ethical considerations because it presumes, and that's a big presumption, that you are working actively with the people who are impacted by the thing. And so you will have taken into consideration their concerns, their issues, um, anything that they might be worried about both from a privacy and security perspective, but also just from a functionality perspective. However, if you're releasing something and it's intended to be used for the public writ large, you're going to have to think about bigger issues, systemic issues, infrastructure issues. The best example I can think of here is a home. If you are custom building a house for someone, you have a lot of decisions you have to make about accessibility, about space, about the way you're going to move within the home. But if you're building a neighborhood or a new community of houses, you have to not only consider those issues for one family, you have to consider them for every kind of family that's potentially going to live in your neighborhood. You also have to think about the sewage system. You also have to think about the road system. You also have to think about parks. You have to think about green space. You have to think about requirements for all of the infrastructure that goes underneath that neighborhood. So that's really what scale gets to. But as you can see, there could definitely be things that are released for a very small population of people that could be equally risky. It's just that the assumption is, if it's a smaller group, you're already actively engaged with them. Next slide. All right, and that brings us to harm. Harm is another tricky one, and I think you're probably starting to see throughout this talk that all of these terms are really open to interpretation. Another reason why it's important to have lots of different people in the room from different backgrounds with different experiences to talk about them. Ostensibly, if you're developing your thing and its purpose is limited and it wasn't designed to cause harm or injury, you probably have a lower risk of worrying about some of these massive at scale fairness and ethical issues. If you're building something that is actually intended to harm someone, then you probably need to think through what the parameters are going to be of that on a much bigger scale. The best example I can think of here, and I should state my biases first, I work with a company called Axon that invented uh, tasers about 25 years ago. Um, I'm on their AI ethics board. They have created a product that without a doubt is designed and intended to cause some kind of harm. The taser was designed to be a meaningful alternative to the use of guns, specifically in a law enforcement situation. So when you're deploying something like that, you need to think about a host of medical issues associated with the functionality of that device. How does it turn off if it goes haywire? What's the right level of shock to give a person? And all of those things come in the context of ethical decision-making 
but it's ethical decision making that you don't necessarily want a hardware engineer to decide. You want to bring in someone with a medical background specifically in the space, which is exactly what they do, to talk about what the implications are, to talk about what the medical research is that backs up the use of this particular technology. The other concern about harm is how do you define it? And that takes us to the next slide. I think in a lot of cases, when people think of harm, specifically when they think about technology or data or information, we immediately go to identity theft, right? Everybody thinks about that, especially post Equifax. And I'm sure you've all received at least, I'm going to say at least two or three different letters from different organizations locally where they've let you know that, oops, we kind of lost your data or, oh, there was a breach or, oh, we don't 100% know where everything is. So all of those usually come, well, actually, no, everyone I've ever had comes with some year of monitoring by TransUnion or Equifax or something like that. Um, but there's way more harm than that. And a lot of harm is actually insidious harm. It's harm that you don't know that you don't know. There was a, a really interesting study done, oh gosh, at least 15, 20 years ago um, by a woman named Latanya Sweeney, who's an incredible computer scientist. And basically she ascertained that it takes about three data points to identify with something like 80 to 90% certainty, anybody in the United States. And those data points aren't significant ones. There are things like zip code and a partial SIN number, like not even things that aren't readily available publicly. Well, take that and apply it to the amount of data we now have available about us all the time, including social media postings. And what you eventually come to is that most technology companies have profiles on everybody that are more or less accurate based on buying habits, viewing habits, technology use, social media postings, and all kinds of other information. Basically, anytime you're online, you're being tracked. Well, what does that mean? We all get lots of ads that pop up in our browsers and on our screens and whenever we interact with anything. But did you know that those ads are also all tailored and they're tailored to your profile, whatever that is, by whatever ad company has put together that profile. So Dr. Sweeney did some more research and discovered that she was personally, without a doubt, being racially profiled for ads and targeted for certain services and products that were very different from her colleagues based on her skin color. And she designed and ran a whole study about this that basically demonstrated that with a certain degree of accuracy, you would get different ads based on where you're physically located and the assumed color of your skin. So what, there's so much to unpack there. What I wanna focus on is the economic harm aspect of that. So if you're profiled in bucket A, you're going to get discount ads for Apple products or different services or first class flights. And if you're profiled in bucket B, and again, whether that's accurate or not, you'll see dating service ads or hot singles in your area or some other thing. And if you're in bucket C, maybe you start to see things like, here's a bankruptcy attorney. Here's a parole services hearing. Here's an ad for delivery from a liquor store. And those ads and buckets of ads absolutely do some economic harm. I think they also do a lot of other harms, but I'm trying to keep the scope focused. So there's an economic loss. There's a social detriment to this profiling. There's also probably a loss of opportunity because a lot of things are happening behind the scenes that you have no visibility to. You don't necessarily know what your profile looks like or how accurate it could be. One of the things a lot of tech companies have done, Facebook included in the last few years, is start to make visible that information and data to you. And I think it's really important to check that out. Next slide. Okay, so from here, I want to talk a little bit about facial recognition. Um, I think in context, you can see how all of these criteria work together. 
um, and you can see how they may begin to trigger some of the issues that we've discussed today and that certainly are the focus of this program. But with facial recognition, there's, uh, I don't know, some really interesting things that are happening in the last week or so here that are highly, highly unusual. So I'm going to try and stay away from the implementation part of that to focus on the conversation around facial recognition. What we've seen for the first time, and it really is the first time, is industry stepping up to say, we're not going to continue to develop and sell this technology until governments get their stuff together and start figuring out how to regulate it, how to put laws around it, how to effectively create a sandbox around what is okay and what is not okay. What's fascinating about that is it's industry saying it. And a lot of people are looking at that as um, maybe tech is finally waking up to dealing with the social impact of their tools and technologies. You could alternatively say that tech is very concerned about the liability of releasing products that do not have the appropriate constraints in them and are concerned about making those decisions independently but it just depends if you're feeling more or less cynical today. Uh, excuse think, me, Tracy. Yeah. I'm sorry. You could also say that industry is also listening. You know, if you're talking about mm -hmm. plucked from the headlines, they're also thinking, uh, and it's not a criticism, they're thinking reputation. There's another risk there. The harm to the industry and, and also being responsive to society. So. I like that even better, Linda. That's even more optimistic because there are many, many, many civil society organizations that have been calling for the regulation of facial technology, biometric technology, gate technology, which if you haven't heard of is another scary thing where you could be identified by the way you walk. Um, and I think everybody's starting to realize that if you take this kind of technology and put it in a system or an industry or a process that may already have problems, you're not just compounding them, you're compounding them at scale. And I think that's where we're really starting to see some of the implications of the clash between civil society, government organizations, and industry, specifically, for example, in the various protests that are happening both in North America, but also, frankly, in China and Hong Kong, where the technology is even, well, it's far more advanced and far more, um, it's far, far more sophisticated in the implementation at scale and the use of it for decision making. So this is where you can start with the issues around facial recognition. Now, I haven't even gotten to where do you get your data from? How are you training your algorithms to recognize faces? What do you do when it's real-time technology as opposed to retroactive use of this technology? How is it used differently by law enforcement versus industry versus say maybe airport security? How are those criteria that we talked about going to be developed and, and thought about in context for that technology and for that meaningful purpose as it moves forward. I think this is also a really good example of why um, I'm glad I'm not a lawyer. Um, I think that, <laughs> and I want to be really clear. I and I'm love, glad I am. <laughs> I, love, I love teaching at the law school, but the thing that drove me to teach at the law school was as a technologist and as a policy wonk for most of my career, I didn't understand why lawyers traditionally didn't get a lot of the core concepts that they were practicing law in. And it wasn't until I spent some time really engaged with the law school and specifically had the opportunity at SU to teach an interdisciplinary class with the lawyers that I really learned that we're all coming from these independent, um, heavily nomenclature-based, heavy inside baseball careers and fields and professions which sort of lock you into thinking about issues a certain way. And what really needs to happen, specifically with a lot of the large social issues we have right now, 
is the opposite of that. We need the lawyer in the room. We need the engineer in the room. We need the policy person in the room. And most of all, we need somebody to guide those conversations together. And I think that's where, again, stating my bias, um, the master's degrees have been a lot more helpful to me in terms of teaching critical thinking, teaching how to review and think about and frame things across disciplines to bring everybody to the table to start to have these kinds of hard conversations. Conversations. And I think that's really my concluding thoughts. We have to cooperate. We have to engage. Um, you need to understand when to talk to a lawyer. Absolutely. That is critical in this field. But mostly what you need to understand is how to cooperate, not just with attorneys, but with everybody in all these different fields as we're developing and moving forward with these technologies at a scale that we've never seen before. And that's really encouraged and allowed for these days. So the unintended consequences of them are going to be enormous. Uh, that's, that's incredible. And again, there was that uh, a, a critical pitch and it's not a marketing pitch as much as realizing uh, as you talked about need, uh, one of the things you said, and I believe talking about your first criteria, of is it a new or existing technology? You also said, and including the reasonable person, I think you called it the run of the mill philosopher at the pub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're my favorite. <laughs> Even better, I'd love it if that philosopher has a master's in legal studies where we see that there was a gap and a need to bridge that gap in people with industry knowledge, myriad industries, but also who understand law and policy and can process the information through that a legal lens without necessarily being trained as a lawyer or being a practitioner in the law. Yeah. But I, I really, and I will check and open for questions and answers, but the key takeaway for me, and it, it goes all the way back to Peter Drucker's guidance in leadership and management 101, is asking the right questions of the right people and the right time. And the right time is early not as a check the box for compliance or risk towards the end of a project, but early and often. And you only know how to ask the question. And, and the questions can be your four to five criteria, almost in ignorance. Sometimes asking a question in ignorance or with just that general knowledge, the person in the room who says, well, what would my grandmother in 1960 have thought about being touched with the back of someone's hand? <laughs> I'm not, I don't know, I, <laughs> I digress. Uh, but again, having knowledge, having the training, and having a program that gives you that broader knowledge to at least know who needs to have a seat at the table and how to, and you could use those four criteria either in a, dis, a decision tree, a mm -hmm. point of view statement, early in ideation. When you're, I know everyone probably has a supervisor who comes in and says, I saw this really cool tool. I was at this tech conference or my kid has this and we're going to use it. And then you say, whoa, let's talk a little bit about scale. Let's talk about harm. It's a, maybe is existing technology being approached in a novel way. So uh, again, I, 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 if I can really distill or synthesize what you said, it's really right questions, right timing, right peeps. Yep, and be the philosopher at the pub. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's perfect. And I think um, the only other thing I'd add is, and iterate, like you, you'll ask these questions maybe two, three, four times as the process goes on and you're gonna get different answers and that's good. The point is to have the conversation. And uh, Tracy, before I get into a little bit about next steps, especially program specific, uh, Lisa, who's attending today, was curious, how can you see cooperation with the government there's no regulation. <laughs> well, Lisa, that is a great question. And I'm glad to be able to put my bureaucrat policy wonk hat on to address it. So I think, I think we get lost in the idea that government, we need to sit back and wait for government to tell us what the law is or to set the rules. And I think it's actually kind of backwards. And, and again, 
here's my bias coming through loud and clear. I actually think we have a lot of these laws already written on the books. I think the intentionality behind a lot of government regulation, advice, and guidance is actually a really long runway. So there are many organizations that look at government policy, that do government white papers, that do research for all different levels of government. You can get in and look at those documents, even see what regulators are writing about privacy and ethics and technology probably two to four years in advance of any type of regulation. So I guess the answer is, to try and make myself a little more succinct, one, you have to do your research and the research isn't necessarily at a law library. It's, um, it's all of the records and research and policy documents that are published, publicly available, and sometimes a chore to find. And that's where a librarian has been the biggest asset I've ever had in my life. Uh, you can hunt down those documents and get an idea of where government policy is going easily, two to five year window. Um, secondly, you have to look at the agencies, boards, commissions, outside of just the traditional like Senate, legislature, parliament kind of framework. What you need to look at is who are all the advisory boards and organizations that seek to influence government policy? Look at what they're doing, look at how successful they've been, and then get in line with those. The other thing that's really tactical that I'm actually toying with having as an assignment, so if anybody has strong feelings, let me know, is that governments will very often at all levels put out calls for comments on draft legislation, draft policies, um, ideas that they might have of where they want to go. The FTC does this a lot. They regulate privacy um, in the United States and they often have open calls for comments, written submissions, um, attending the conferences to see what the policy wonks are saying and what direction they want to head in. Those are all really good ways to engage, to anticipate, and to also contribute any ideas, opinions, and thoughts that you have. You don't have to be an academic or you know, a professional in the field. It, it's actually really a good opportunity for everybody to share the equal space. Thank you, Tracy. And I would say that it is helpful if you have a master's in legal studies in compliance and risk management. No, I, 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 Joe, you know, uh, uh, informality aside, uh, one of the things we did in looking at this program is, for example, the required legal writing and research course is specifically designed for the legal research and writing, the persuasive or predictive writing you would do at any management or leadership role, not even if you're a compliance professional, uh, whether you're with the government, a publicly traded company, any industry of uh, and then interpreting statutes regulations speaking to that librarian uh, and knowing how to narrow your search but not too narrowly uh, and and that is just critical the art of draft and then we have courses in how to draft policies whether they're internal operating procedures and processes uh, in an hr department or whether they're public policies that'll impact the broader society and and I just can't uh, I think in the last week we've all been facing and still processing the trauma of pandemics the trauma of our protests uh, the broader social issues that we are all wrestling with and it's still visceral but the reassurance you see when it's industry that says whoa somebody somebody be an adult in the room and make a decision um and that's and coming from industries also in our region made me realize how timely and relevant our to today's discussion in this program is and how dynamic it is and how we really how it models our messaging and our motto that this is compliance with a conscience that industry realizes we have a product it could be scary uh, and with a conscience they are considering the harms uh, and all of the criteria you talked about and and it's just it, it's allayed some of my concerns and stressors and we can be leaders you know everyone says what can we be doing right now and even in the conversations at the kitchen table 
or on the streets, the criteria that you shared with us are things that we can talk about in dialogues with each other. It's not just in the workplace. And I think that's a really good point too, Linda, and I've been challenged by that even just personally, um, as a lot of these larger systemic issues come up in my friend group, you, you have to make a decision, like, are you going to engage? Are you not? And, you know, I joke about maybe it's the Canadian in me, but I typically punt those conversations in America because I'm not American. And so there's a certain amount of legitimacy and authenticity that I worried about bringing to the conversation. But in recent years, I've just decided that's not how this works anymore. These aren't bounded problems. They aren't only impacting certain groups of people. What's being built and created now it's a lot more like climate change. It's a lot more like COVID. It's a lot more like concerns and considerations and things that exist at a scale we've literally never seen in human history before. And there's an old joke in computer science from way back in the 70s when the internet was DARPA and, and it was being used for scientists to send jokes to each other mostly. Um, and it is that computers won't prevent you from making a problem better or worse, but they will allow you to make really bad problems a lot faster. <laughs> and I think the intentionality behind that, and that was even before we had the network and infrastructure we do now, but the intentionality behind that is to help us all understand that whatever we put out there now exists forever. And that's a dramatically different perspective than the one we had before everything was networked and infrastructure was there. But it's also just really a precursor. I mean, COVID doesn't care about internet access. Uh, so there's going to be more and more problems like this that are systemic, that we need to have people who are ready to think about raise questions about, make decisions on, and then somehow find a way to keep going. And I think that's really the challenge here. And Tracy, if you had your 1960 era grandmother in the room, uh, or anyone else, the, that philosopher at the pub, and even in attendees here, I saw in some of the chats, uh, the frightening nature of technology, of facial recognition, of what we're experiencing in current events. What is maybe one or two takeaways uh, that you would say, you don't be frightened because? <laughs> um, okay, that's a good challenge. I, I like that question, you know, and I will, I will buy myself 30 seconds of time to answer it by telling you that I taught um, my second year of teaching where I was still trying to figure out what I was doing. I, one of the students came up to me afterward after one of our classes where we'd spent a great deal of time talking about unintended consequences. Um, at the time it was about mislabeling of photos and the harm that that could do. And, and she said to me, I love this class, but I go home every night terrified and I was just wondering if maybe we could stop doing that. <laughs> And, you know, I laugh now, but at the time I was devastated and I really thought, yeah, you're missing out if you don't, you're, you're missing out if the only message you communicate is fear, because there are so many incredibly positive things that can and are happening because of the internet, because of technology, because of the systemic use. The problem becomes what you layer it on top of. And, you know, that um, probably wholly inappropriate nowadays, but that notion of, of the lipstick on the peg comes to mind in my head a lot. We, it, it's not that we have to be afraid of the tech or afraid of what's going to come. It's that what we have to understand is we're building it on top of a system that has massive problems in it already. Processes that need to be corrected, uh, systemic inequality that needs to be addressed, um, benefits that are not equally distributed. Uh, and people can and will get lost along the way unless you're at the table reminding everybody about them. And that's really the thing I would encourage everybody to do. We seem to have gotten to a place in a lot of countries, mine included, where discourse and disagreement are no longer civil. 
And I think that means that a lot of people, myself included, have backed away from having hard conversations because you don't want to start something significant and systemic that ruins a relationship or sidetracks workplace or maybe isn't appropriate for other people. But the only way we're going to learn about each other is to have those conversations and to trust that if you go into them with good intentions and are cautious and thoughtful, you'll learn something. And I throw this out at everybody acknowledging that it's been really hard for me. I have a friend who has dramatically different political philosophies than I do. And there are times where we are going to have and have had really hard conversations where we're not going to meet in the middle. But you have to have the conversation. We can't keep carving out us and them, whatever your us is, whatever your them is. And sometimes these kinds of questions are a good backdoor into understanding what other people's experiences are, what their beliefs are, and then ultimately finding a way to work together. Wow. I'm le I'm, I'm, I've learned so much just talking with you and working with you and, and trying to listen to other people too. Uh, and I also realize how much growth I need professionally and personally, uh, but one of the one of the greatest things I do know is that knowledge is power. When people feel, um, un, you know, that they have no power, we look at opportunities of education, uh, of sharing of knowledge, and access to knowledge, whether it's uh, on computers or or in books and or in a traditional institution. But uh, I know a Christian who joined us today uh, was curious, again, the, the nuts and bolts of, so, okay, what do some of the students do? I think in looking at the concluding thoughts with the kind of jobs and the industries uh, working in government, mm -hmm. uh, in government agencies, there's people who become the enforcers, who become the legislatures, there's public policy, there's lobbyists, consultants, right? And industry as well, Linda. I mean, I've increasingly, in the last four, I would say four years specifically, I have seen more and more people and participated in more and more hiring cycles for people who have um, ethical experience and education and certifications and knowledge and are being brought in specifically for that, for people who are interdisciplinary and are being brought to the table for that, for people who have um, graduate education education because it demonstrates critical thinking skills, like it's your stamp for that. Um, but, but industry is using those people to think about questions like this and how to adjust products accordingly, how to change services accordingly, how to, and, and in some cases it's about liability for sure and PR, it absolutely is. But there is also a really significant component of your work that is about sitting hand in glove with people who are creating things and helping them understand the context for the creation. Absolutely. And being the person who's raising the unintended consequences. And yeah. Oh, excuse me, Tracy. Yeah, yeah, and just an example, one of our cohorts, uh, I know they hail from uh, maritime industry, uh, financial services, uh, both finance institutions as well as depository institutions, healthcare compliance, uh, people who come out of uh, quality assurance and cybersecurity. So myriad industries, and it's fun to see them interact in the classroom to yeah. find novel ways to resolve issues where the maritime uh, student said, we saw, and the, uh, another person said, oh my gosh, I'm going to go back to my credit union tomorrow and talk to my senior vice president. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very enriching um, and more of an executive level education too, but also for people who are new uh, uh, to that industry. And even our faculty, our our lawyers who say, you know, I'm learning to think about risk outside of lit litigious risk or mm -hmm. liability. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, it, and the facilitated discussions are just really, really um, uh, thought provoking and exciting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. 
I uh, know we're getting a little short of time, so I did want to just uh, offer up the next steps. Again, for those of you who are attending uh, and might be considering a master's degree or just wanted to attend on the topic and to see uh, Dr. Kosa speak, if you have any colleagues who might be looking for opportunities for professional development, we do offer this part-time fully online uh, that can be completed within two years. Uh, and you can contact me or my team at any time uh, to learn more about the program. We will respond to your inquiries promptly uh, and hopefully you will enroll with us. Uh, just important upcoming dates, a priority deadline for your applications are July, is, uh, July 1st and our next cohort starts in the fall, September 8th. Again, fully online. Uh, your opportunity would be to work with me, uh, but most importantly, to have uh, faculty who would welcome you as colleagues, uh, such as uh, Dr. Tracy Kosa. I'm going to check to see if there's any more questions. And folks are more than welcome to contact me directly as well if you have questions that you just don't feel comfortable bringing up right now. Absolutely. And that's one thing that I love about our program, too, whether it's this online program or Seattle University in general, uh, the approachability and the humility, uh, regardless of the scholarship and the practitioner. We love the practitioner scholar, uh, but the approachability of our alumni uh, and of our faculty, uh, it's just uh, unsurpassed. I'm 20 years in higher education and uh, I am just, I'm, I never cease to be amazed uh, with the passion of our professors. So thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, it's really just a pleasure to work with you and it was a pleasure to learn from you today. Thank this you. is the contact information. Call me, my virtual door is open and I look forward to hearing from you. Dr. Kosa, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you and thanks to everybody. <laughs> thank you everyone from jo for joining us and uh, we appreciate the time you took. Good day now.